Hello, my name is Sasha Struthers. I am an attorney and now broker in Los Angeles and today I'm going to do a video on Section 8. I have seen quite a few people kind of tout how much like money they've made accepting Section 8 vouchers, though that's somewhat true. I find that kind of be really weird and tacky way to approach it. However, I do see that, you know, landlords accepting Section 8 vouchers, especially here in LA, has actually had some of a positive impact on both landlords and tenants. If you're not familiar, Los Angeles is having a really tough time housing individuals and have invested the city itself and the Fed have invested um, in getting more vouchers out. With that kind of buzz and people hearing about it in the news, I thought I would do a video about it considering I have experience with leasing to Section 8 tenants, dealing with Section 8 tenants, and dealing with the whole application process and the annual inspections. So I'm just going to dive right into it. And from the top, I'm going to give you a brief explanation as to what Section 8 is. So Section 8 is a division of the Housing and Urban Development branch of the federal government, you know, their agency. HUD, which is, you know, what that is, will give out Section 8 vouchers. Those vouchers are actually called Housing Choice Vouchers, but people call them vouchers or Section 8 vouchers. Housing Choice means that the tenant can take the voucher, they can shop it around, and they can try to use it at an apartment or a house of their choosing, rather than the government telling them, okay, you're going to be in this house housing. That's kind of a different thing. We're not going to talk about it, but there is like government subsidized housing. So housing choice means just that you can use your voucher and choose the apartment or the house that you want to be in. Now the vouchers are administered locally through what's called public housing agencies, PHAs. Here in Los Angeles, the two big ones are HACLA and LACDA. So HACLA is for the city of Los Angeles, LACDA is for unincorporated county. And then the few other cities have like their own local you know, PHAs. So the PHA is basically the case manager. They are the ones who will see you through the process. They help the tenants do their paperwork. They help the landlords do their paperwork. That's, you know, what we typically call like the case manager. With that, that's kind of the broad overview. So yes, Section 8 is a federal program, but it's administered locally, meaning the local agency is the one responsible for paying the landlord the money. They're the ones who handle the file. They handle the inspections, they handle the initial lease, they handle the rent increases, etc. There's two main components to what makes the Section 8 program, you know, viable or balanced. One is there's commitment, or that's not one, the main thing is there's commitment by the tenants and the landlords. In this case, the landlord's committing to providing a habitable premise that meets the criteria that HUD has. And the tenant's commitment is that they will every year turn in their paperwork to exemplify that they qualify for their voucher. And then they too will, you know, cooperate, behave, abide by the rules, abide by the law, typically keep their unit in good condition. So those are the two promises on each side. The voucher tends to act as kind of like a security for the landlord because the vouchers are given to tenants that are very low income, that are disabled or elderly, so they otherwise can't afford market rent on their own. So the security the landlord gets is that the program will pay up to like 70% of the rent. So typically the threshold is a tenant can't pay more than 30% of their income towards the voucher. And there are some voucher holders who don't pay anything that the Section 8 program pays all of the rent. So that's why it's kind of an incentive for property management companies or landlords to accept these vouchers. And during COVID, I know that that had saved a lot of landlords because a lot of tenants were unable to pay rent but Section 8 kept paying. And so for a lot of landlords that didn't have like Section 8, some of them really struggled because they didn't have that kind of security. Whereas Section 8 continued to pay throughout COVID-19. And I think that's part of what kind of shifted landlords into being more receptive and positive. Granted, in California, there's legislation around Section 8 vouchers that you can't necessarily deny accepting a voucher if it you know, is able to cover the asking rent, the main upside for landlords in accepting the voucher. But I'm gonna talk a little bit more later in the video about the other positives that I think people don't tend to account for, but I think really are persuasive arguments as to why landlords should be a little more receptive to vouchers. 
we kind of went over what the vouchers are, how they work. Now I'm gonna get into kind of the section of process and leasing with them. So like I said earlier, it's a housing choice voucher. So the tenant can essentially choose their housing or try to take their voucher and apply it to um, a property within the jurisdiction of that voucher. There's a few ways that landlords can try to advertise their property to seek Section 8 vouchers. For one, you can typically just in any place that you list your vacancy, say Section 8 welcome. You can't say vouchers not accepted that could get you in hot water. But if you want to, you know, attract Section 8 voucher holders or just, you know, you can attract anybody, but a lot of times people with vouchers are really reluctant to go apply to places that don't openly say we accept vouchers because they automatically feel like they're going to be denied because they're a voucher holder. So if your listing says, hey, we accept Section 8, then you're inclined to get more applications. And there's also Section 8 itself has its own listing service that you can list for free, kind of similar to like, apartments.com but it's section 8 so there you can also list your and fill out all the information and then people with vouchers will go there knowing very well that already the landlord's going to accept a voucher so those are kind of just the two slight different changes that you would make in your advertising I will say as of late 10 inch just across the board are not picky, but they really are shopping around. There's been a slight correction in rents. Rents were really, really high, and they're starting to come down a little bit, which is by and large due to a lot of different things, but also just people simply can't afford crazy rent. So they're in some areas of LA, I've seen corrections in rent. And I've also seen tenants go, hey, you know, I need a unit with a little bit more upgrades, or, you know, I saw a place down the street that's been remodeled and has this, this, and this, and yours doesn't. So it is a little competitive, but that's Section 8 or non-Section 8. It's getting a lot more competitive in the housing market in LA, just in general. Just because someone has a Section 8 voucher doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be easy to get an application for them or they'll automatically accept it. Like people with vouchers, just like everybody else, they're shopping around. So just understand when you're pricing your unit, you have to take into account that you have other competition. Additionally, Section 8 establishes the rent. HUD actually establishes it and they establish it for the area. Like Los Angeles has its rent. So if you were to go to HUD and you would look up the rent for Los Angeles, you would see, you know, what they charge for studios, what they charge for one bedrooms, two bedrooms, etc. So they have that number. That number tends to be the higher end of the chart. So like I mentioned earlier, things are a little competitive. So when you do the application process, the first step they actually do is you have an application, you go, okay, then you fill out what's called an RFTA packet. So that's the packet where you fill out as the landlord all the information about the apartment, the asking rent that you want, how old the apartment is, you know, certain amenities that it has, how big the unit is. So you fill out that packet, it's a pretty long packet, but you fill it out and in part of that packet, they're gonna ask you, hey, what have you rented other you know, units in your building for? So they gather a lot of data, and then they also, the advisor, that's what they call the person who administers the file for the PHA, they're called like advisors. They know, they know what's being um, paid in similar buildings in the area. So they collect all this data and then they send out someone to inspect the unit. And they have a checklist, which I will link below, the most recent checklist that I've seen that I deal with. So you can get an idea of what they're looking for when they inspect the unit. And the unit, the utilities have to be on at the time of the inspection. So the utilities, you know, usually go in the tenant's name, some of them do, but when they inspect it, they want to have all the utilities on. So they go through this checklist, they inspect it, and they give it back to the advisor. And if there's some corrections, they tell the landlord, okay, go make the corrections. You know, once they're done, call us, they'll send out another, the inspector again, they'll inspect it. Once the unit's good to go, then the advisor will take up, you know, the amenities that the property has, what was being rented recently at the property and what's been rented in the area that's comparable and they'll give a rent offer. The rent offer is more or less kind of the offer. You can do some slight negotiating. Typically I've seen this is the offer, take it or leave it. And so that's the process. So you first find someone who's interested in your apartment. You go, okay, I'm willing to take section eight. It covers the asking rent that I'm asking for or is close to it. Then you do the RFTA packet. So you fill out the paperwork then they send out an inspector, then you get the rent offer. If you accept the rent offer, and then what's gonna happen is you're gonna draft up a lease. And the lease has to match 
what Section 8 is approved. So they're gonna approve the rent and then they're gonna approve like the move-in date. Now, the one thing that I do see, Section 8 doesn't pay the security deposit. Typically though, someone with a Section 8 voucher, the, the tenant, the voucher holder, they usually work with many nonprofits or other organizations that help them pay the rent and typically they pay two times the rent, a security deposit. That's the max that you can charge for an unfurnished apartment, which typically apartments or houses are unfurnished just in general in California. They typically have programs to help them, otherwise the tenant is responsible for paying the security deposit. Typically security deposits are two times rent. I've seen that being a trend in LA for quite a while now. So that's the one thing I just wanna say that the program or section itself doesn't pay it, though usually there is other programs in the area that will help cover that cost for the tenant.